Rolling. How you going? We're Frank and Bok, and you're watching The Hard Rock Show. If you keep watching, this is going to be The Hard Cock Show. Ah, I keep it so hard. We've been joined tonight by the mighty Frank Bok once again. How are you guys? Awesome. How you doing? Good, good. Now, first of all, for those who don't know you, introduce yourselves and your role within the band. Hey, um, as a bock, I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, is, this band's my fault. I started it and I dragged these guys into it. I'm Daniel, I'm the singer, and yeah, it's his fault that I'm here. <laughs> and Tom on drums. <laughs> and he's here because I brainwashed his ass. <laughs> Changing cult. And Changing his brain. Cult. Yeah. His brain is in his ass. No, no, he's a very smart guy. They know me as ass brain. <laughs> This is going to be fun. Um, now, the last time I spoke to you was in November 2015. Yes. That was when you guys were last down here. So it's been a little while. Yep. Since then, what's the band generally been up to in that time frame? Troubleshooting. Troubleshooting. Putting out fires, <laughs> starting fires, uh, burning down churches mainly, but... Um, or posing in front of them. Trying to get... I think last time we were here, we were talking about a record that we were recording. Yeah. And since then, we were trying to record that record um, and we had um, lineup changes basically all the way through the writing and the recording of that record the band was on uh, life support yeah. um, you know it was just a constant struggle just to keep it alive and there was times where are we actually really going to get this record done is this mm. actually going to see the light of day so that's just we didn't look like we were doing people you know like thinking that I thought Frank and Buck had split up because we weren't doing very much in the public eye, whereas behind the scenes, I'm like using everything that I've got to keep this shit, you know, yeah. running. And so, in between, like writing the songs and actually just trying to, we were like, you know, change, hiring and firing dudes and all that sort of stuff. So, that's taken up all of our energy. So, that's what's been going on pretty much since then. So, on that point, just to cover it off, how much of the lineup has changed and, and that sort of process? And how, how big of a hurdle is that? to overcome um it's absolutely it, it's totally it's a massive thing mm. because um get the wrong dude and it can poison the whole idea and it can be the end like one wrong member can be enough for the other members that in there go i've had a gut full of this shit you know mm. yeah. um although all the most of the transitions have been pretty fucking easy well i've been telling people like there's been a lot of ass in this. I've been very, very lucky. Um, somehow, I've managed to replace more than half the band, mm. not with just some hired guns that want to get involved in something that seems like semi-established, like, oh, you guys seem like you do stuff, so I wouldn't mind joining that because you are doing stuff. I've been lucky enough to get people, everyone that's joined the band, have always been into the band. They've been fans of the band, so... Um, um, these guys, when we first started playing, were at Frankenbox shows. Um, so it's really cool. If you can get a new member of your band that's not just a hired gun that has heard of you, if you can get someone who's already got all your records and actually knows how your songs go, well, it's, it's, um, it's a massive plus. And I've been really lucky that that's happened with every single member. You know, like with these guys, I've sort of go, um, I wouldn't mind doing such and such song. And the common reply is like, I don't, I'm not sure if I know how to play it, but I know how it goes, you know, because mm. they're familiar with the, they've been there. I think Tommy's band, when we did um, our first record, his band played the, um, our CD launch, uh, I Solar at the time. Yeah, we yeah. supported them for loopholes. Yep, cool. I Solar. Yep, still got the original two shirt <laughs> kicking around. Nice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's um, you know, I've been so lucky that Everybody that's in the band has kind of been familiar with the band. And even before these guys, with uh, Dan and Yeti that were in the band, mm. there's a photo of us playing at like, the green room in Melbourne, and the two dickheads down the front that are like, yeah, yeah, like banging their heads, it's like Dan and Yeti. Mm. They just were on that side of the stage, and then they're on that side of the stage, and it's been kind of similar. So everybody's been kind of pretty much in-house, which has been really cool because it's you know it's not like somebody comes to the band you've got to try and tell them what we're about yeah these guys knew just what kind of dickhead to be <laughs> yeah they've been seeing us for years and now they get to have a go of being an idiot too so 
they know just how to behave or how to not behave. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So what's it like for you guys coming in to the project? Remember, I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> in time for a new cycle to start as well, which He's is always exciting. He's a fucking exciting. dictator. It's, uh, it's just horrible. He beats us. It's behind the... <laughs> <laughs> he thinks he's Phil Anselmo <laughs> yeah. no it was really cool like the first few months it was really fucking surreal I mean my 14 year old self who used to go and see these guys at fucking Moorabbin Town Hall was just going fucking yeah and getting up on stage it was the first show it's the only time I've ever been nervous getting up on stage like 20 minutes before the we were set to get on there I was asleep on a couch I was fucking I didn't give a shit. <laughs> Five minutes before I'm on stage, I'm nervous as shit. I'm shaking. I'm fucking pacing back and forth. I couldn't handle it. I got on stage and it was like, it was just me again, you know? Mm. But yeah, it was really surreal. And then, um, yeah, I just, I, I just, you just kind of get into, you get into your groove and you relax and everything's just really cool. They're good guys to hang out with. They're good guys to fucking play with. I always have a lot of banter and a lot of fun on stage. And yeah, it's, it's good. Yeah, well, Dan came in a bit earlier than mm. I did, probably, what, a year before? About a year maybe? before you, yeah. Yeah, and we, we, I kind of transitioned in from the period that we had together in previous projects uh, with Azra and Tim. Mm. And, um, yeah, being with, seeing Frankenbock throughout the years, sort of knowing all the songs was, you think, okay, cool, this is, this is fucking awesome, we can do this. And you walk in and they've got all the songs written up on the whiteboard, every single album that they've ever written with every track listed out. Nice. And well, you're thinking, oh, shit, what's the set list, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so uh, the, the transition um, from Mick uh, on the drums to, to me playing it, it, it wasn't as simple as Mick just walked away and then I came in and it was done. Uh, we had plenty of uh, drill sessions down at the lab where we rehearse uh, with both of us there. Like Mick would jump on a kit, not be on the kit next to him. I'd be watching his movements just to see exactly how he did the beats. And cool. we spent um, quite a few rehearsals together doing that and had a couple of meetings together, even just discussing how the different parts are played. And wow. um, just being able to do that for the transition process just made it a hell of a lot easier. Um, you know, jamming with the guys, there's no worries. I mean, they've done it for 20 years now plus and uh, they all know their shit which is awesome so um, it's a big leap from past projects that I've done um, to come into something that's fully established and the wheels are already turning and to be able to try and get the machine moving to where it should be where, where I believe it should be yeah. pick it up speed now yeah, yeah we're, we're getting, getting there, getting there. Mm. We're yeah. well speaking of you hear today to talk about Vicious Lawless, which is, we, we, we pre-orchestrated this. <laughs> <laughs> How many releases does this make for you overall, for Frank and Bob? I got overall? asked that the other day, yeah. and I took my shoes and socks off and counted it all up, <laughs> wasn't it? and, and I fucking still got it wrong. It was yeah. eight, wasn't it? It's eight now, yeah, but, yeah. but I... I think, I got done. Seven. seven. I yeah. left out one, you know. But. <laughs> yeah, but the bookkeeper was on it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is number eight. Number eight. <laughs> <laughs> now you recorded this one yourselves at your own. Um, no, uh, yes, we recorded ourselves. It's um, last time we were here. It was like me and Dan, yep. the old vocalist, and we were here talking, you know, threatening the world that we're you got, threatening the world that we're coming for you. We're going to have world domination and stuff. And I think it was the the following day or the day after. Dan said, "No." Nah, I don't think I can do this anymore. Yeah. And he sort of stepped aside as vocalist. Um, but it's weird. He sort of he left the band, went out the back door, and he came in the front door. And he's been more active in the band now than he ever was in the band. Because yeah. um, yeah, he just won't fuck off. No, nah, <laughs> no. Nah. He um, <laughs> he like um, started to he, he started to get a real interest in the recording side of things because he's the one that runs Fair Dinkum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's his. Yeah. Um, so he started to, you know, take a real interest in the recording part of it, and he just had an incredible knack for it. You know, just a natural talent. No schooling or no study had gone into it. He just had listened to that much music mm. that he knows what it should sound like, and I think that's half the battle because you can learn and study everything, but you got to have good ears. Yeah. So he didn't really know his way around the dials that well, but he knew what he was trying to find. Yeah. Whereas a lot of people are very, very skilled in all the equipment, but don't know what it is that they're looking for. So Dan started to work on um, doing demos and bits and pieces for us. And then 
now he's um he ended up recording the whole album for us let alone um he's like shooting videos for us and doing all our like you know um, media shit and doing your merch as well merchandise yeah. just yeah. making cups of tea just <laughs> everything so like He's at more band practices than you are. <laughs> Our old singer is like, if Dan's not there, it's like, Dan's not here? It's like, no. It's like, McDougal's not here either. Like, if Dan McDougal's not here, people are like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> because they just couldn't give a he's, fuck. He'll just, just do it, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it's weird. Um, since he left the band, he's become like right behind us and helping us with every little part, you know, which has been, which has been really good. So how long did it take to actually get this one recorded and, and ready for release? I've honestly lost track of time in general. No, it, <laughs> since we started going, right, and it goes like this, starting to write, writing the first song for the album and all the shit and all the years that, mm. that went on to when we actually had it mastered to now it's actually in the shops. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how many years and it was years you know of just demos and this and that and you know members leaving and life-changing events that you know blows out another six months and all that so I couldn't well, tell you how long from start to finish start to finish I don't know but the final product like from when we actually started recording the songs properly probably would have only been about a year but there's a period of going from the demo yeah. side of the songs to the actual font finish side of the songs oh, which they're going to be on the CD and that, which was that fuck was for all of us because in the transition Tom, period of the band as well yeah because yeah. Tommy to learn the new songs he was learning the demo versions, versions of it <laughs> I was writing to old versions of it as well and I get to fucking practice and they've changed it or they, they show me a new demo or oh, where the fuck's this bit or what's this bit it's, it, it wasn't there before and I haven't written anything for it it was fun though it was, it's completely different to what I've ever done before so yeah it was good fun but uh, yeah, I think about a year with the total final product recording process, not including all the demos and. All and some of that shit. shit was like you know when we, when we, actually had it finished, um, and then like you hand it over to the people that are going to manufacture it or whatever. Like we call the next day, like, oh, is it done yet? Like what the fuck? <laughs> you know, and there were certain reasons like, you know, it, oh we're going to push it back to here, we're going to push it back to there, and we're like, Fuck. and then, right, cool, we're going to do this big tour. And then it's going to come out here, and then we end up doing the super heist thing. Oh, we'll push back some more. I'm like, mm, you know. Yeah. And I didn't like it that it kept on getting pushed back because it just seemed like it was never, ever going to happen. And it happened not long ago. And I remember talking to him on an interview ago, going, Oh, it's a real pleasure speaking to you on the eve of your album coming out. And I was like, Holy shit. Ah. That's tomorrow. I was only kid forgetting about Christmas. Mm. You know, I was like, It's really happening. You know, so sort of snuck up on me a little bit because I started to believe it was never actually going to get done because mm. <laughs> during it, it was definitely there was times when I went this is not going to fucking come out this is not going to see the light of day but you know we got lucky to have a good team around us yeah. helping us get it done Fuck as well we had um, mm. all the artwork was done by Nick Rackham from Hodemore um, and he's basically uh, the, the artwork stems from uh, an experience that Azza had Oh, I was going to ask about it, so yeah, elaborate on the artwork for us. You know, yeah. Now roll up your sleeves. Yeah, I'm going to fucking chomp by a, a dog like here and here. Um, I'll, I'll do it quick, but I was working up in like on in Donnybrook area. I was working on the side of the road, um, packing up those VMS signs, you know, the yellow trailers with a plea, uh, police checking speed in this area. And I was down there uh, undoing padlocks and chains to the wheels and shit. You know, you get that feeling like you're being watched. So I'm on the fr uh, side of the freeway, and I look around behind me, and just out of the bushes come this rock wheeler, and the biggest one I've ever seen. And I remember, and I, and I said it out aloud, and there's no one else around because he's coming straight towards me, and I went, whoa! I said, I hope you're friendly. And he come like, up to me, and I was just spitting out on how big he was. And he did that thing where he pushed his head in, and I was like, hey there. And he was like, friendly as. And I remember I was down on my knees, rubbing his chest, going, whoa, you're a big boy. You had a chest like this. And yeah. I was like rubbing his chest going, wow, look at the size of you. And he was cool. And so I went back to what I was doing. And then he went around the other side of the trailer. And he's that far away from four lines of, uh, four lanes of traffic on the freeway. Uh, he's going to get hit. Yeah. And so I'm like, hey, come back here. So he came back around. And I'm like, I can't just leave him here because he's 
big dumb Roddy. He's yeah. like, gonna, he's gonna walk straight out there. And uh, we, we came from that direction. I went, come, come with me. And he, he started to follow me. He's walking beside me. And then he starts to take the lead. Like he knows where he's going. So I've walked down between these bushes and stuff. And then I come to like a, a so- service road, side road, and I can see a couple of factories. And I see this woman getting out of a car and across the car park I kind of yelled out um I said excuse me does this dog belong to you and she looked at me this weird sort of worried look on her face she said um no he doesn't belong to me he belongs in that place there she said um he's been known to be quite aggressive and I was looking right in her eyes when she said that and I didn't see him and whack he's grabbed me like a great oh, white no. shark and yank did I lose him he's just yanked me like starting to pull me down and I just ripped my arm out like that and I didn't even know what had happened because I didn't see him coming at yeah. all and he's got my arm out and I've taken a few steps back and before I even know what's happened then he's grabbed this arm and this time like there he actually bit a chunk of muscle off because I ripped it out yeah. because it was just a reaction whereas this time he didn't have skin and muscle he had my bone and he had the pressure on and he started to yank me down to the ground. And that's when I shit myself. And I said, well, in the statement there, I yelled out, he's not fucking playing with me. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. he start, he's yanking me towards the ground. And the size of this dog, you know, the whole fight or flight thing, I went, if I go down, I'm gone. And I knew he, he's, he wasn't just an angry dog. He's like cutting sick. Yeah. Um, he had his moves. He knew exactly what he was doing. And his next step was to get me at eye level. And then I'm fucked, you know? Yeah. And I was thinking, I, I don't... And he's, he's got me that tight. I kind of <laughs> got my fingers in the nostrils because I knew if I ripped it out, I'm losing everything. Yeah. And I kind of rolled my arm out, got away again. And I thought, what next? And then I heard a voice from behind me go, quick, come in here. And the door opened right behind me. And it was the woman that I saw who was running around screaming for help. And then just this door opened and I popped in this door, door shut, next thing I know I'm sitting in an office and there's all these people crowding around me and there's Mr. First Aid guy who's been waiting his whole life for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and they rolled up this sleeve and it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's like flopped open and I can see me bones and all kinds of spaghetti and shit. And I'm thinking, I'm fucked. Because this one wasn't hurting that much. Yeah. This one was hurting really bad, and I was like really scared to see what was underneath. I didn't want to roll that sleeve yeah. back because I thought it would have been just like, you know, bone basically. Um, so, moments later, I'm in an ambulance and I'm like sucking on the thing. I go, hey, it's all good. I'm in a band, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but being kind of whacked up on whatever drugs they gave me, I also was thinking, Mm, fucking that's it it's no more guitar for me mate you know mm. I was thinking be I'm sweet. gone because I could yeah. see everything inside there and it was real nasty and I went into surgery and stuff and I woke up afterwards and they're like mate you're so lucky he said he was all up in your grill he uh he said you got indentations on your bones it was in amongst your tendons and he said I don't know how but you're not going to have any permanent damage and so like the from what that looks like, yeah. Um, if you see like the red picture, you yeah, can't believe it looks that good. The surgeons, they got to me, the ambulance were there in like 15 minutes and I was cleaned up really quickly, mm. surgery really quickly, so I, I healed really well. I think it was at band practice that next. Oh yeah, <laughs> couldn't stop you. Because <laughs> it was really weird. Um, I was technically fucked. Yeah. And they're telling me, oh, you can't go to this work for a long time and all that, and I'm like, I feel, I've got these two big white bandages, but I'm not really in any pain, probably because I did such a good, quick job on it. Mm. I'm like, good to go to band practice like a day or so later. And everyone's telling me, you won't be going to work for a long time. It's like, I can't go to work and I'm not sick. This is fucking unreal. Because legitimately I couldn't go to work, Mm. but I wasn't fucking bedridden. So I was like, (laughs) this is sick. (laughs) So I had a whole lot more time to play music and stuff, you know? So that's what happened there. But yeah, yeah. Another couple of seconds, yeah. he was big enough to take me out. And I've lived with Roddy's before, and I love them, and I've played with them, and I know how strong they are. But there's a difference between... This guy was a, um, he's a guard dog mm. owned by bikers. 
and he's trained to be a killer, yeah. you know. Um, and to feel something, a dog like that, with that much power, he felt like he was made of concrete, you know. Yeah. Like I said, I've, I've wrestled with Roddy's before having a good time, but to feel the strength that he had, it was just like, I've met my match, man. He's yeah, taking, you know, yeah. and I'm that much bigger, but he had he had me, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> like, <it's, laughs> yeah, no ducking and weaving was going to make a difference, you know. Yeah. Another another two seconds and I would have been out. So, yeah. So, um, we went over to, we actually uh, went over to uh, Nick Rackham's. We were actually just going to do a T-shirt. And I basically explained the story to him with him sitting there going, <laughs> you know, he looked kind of in shock. <laughs> and uh, I was looking around at his house and his artwork and I was like, why would we get this guy to just do us a T-shirt? This guy should do the, the album artwork because he's so good. So after explaining the story to him, he started sending us a couple of pictures and I was like, so that's what he came up with and I'm absolutely st- stoked with it. I reckon it's, it's brilliant. It's one far off that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was brutal. So that's what happened there. Doggy yeah. Chomp. <laughs> we should have called the album. Doggy Chomp. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> Scooby Snacks. I'm a walking Scooby Snack. <laughs> but yeah, like, people go, what a horrible thing. I go, I'm so lucky. I'm really lucky that it happened, you know. I got a whole lot of time off work, so that was good. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So speaking on the album, we covered the artwork. What about the title? Where does that come from? I'm glad that you guys are here. I don't know. Oh, I, I, I thought it sounded tough and cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a dumbass. I was like, oh, it actually means um, it's about the budget. No. <laughs> fuck the fuck out. Vicious, vicious Lawless. I was like, yeah. It was Timmy that came up with it. It was... Um, he tells was, me it was Yeti and Dan that came up with it. Oh, it could have been, but I heard it from Timmy, so I'm saying it was him. Yeah. But with the artwork coming back, it kept coming back with woe on it. Yeah, you like that one, didn't you? And I thought that was fucking shit out. So I said, <laughs> really? We're gonna... We've got all this fucking... Everything has gone into this album. It's been brewing for fucking years, and people are gonna pick it up and call, oh, it's Frankenbock. Whoa. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and I just said, nah. I said, there's, there's no chance in fucking hell we're gonna call this album Whoa. So we've got to think of something better. Well, what do you think? No idea. Timmy came up with it was vicious lawless something something mm-hmm. and I said vicious lawless sounds cool and so we pretty much said okay yeah everyone everyone agreed to vicious lawless and now we're we're kind of saying well it's kind of the direction of the album it's vicious and it's lawless mm. it's basically everything we, we're doing our own thing with <laughs> We, we don't care what if people like it or not I mean, back to back to its primitive form I guess. yeah that's yeah, it that's I mean it, it's, it's great if people like it but it's ours it's what we want to do it's what we want to hear that's it yeah, it's that. vicious sounding and as far as what yeah, the dumb yeah. thing is fucking we're not really yeah it's that brutal and it's unconventional mm. there's laws of music and what should or shouldn't be doing yeah. be done and it's just got nothing to do with us <laughs> yeah <laughs> And that, that's that's pretty much the bullshit story that we're coming up with. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on that note, like you were saying there about you getting back to the more primitive side of, of Frankenbach, and, and I've seen some people, other reviewers say that this is like the purest form of of Frankenbach. Do you guys feel that it's the case? Is like the the return to what it's supposed to be about? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, every band says about their new album, oh, this is their best stuff and this is my favourite album. But this is our best stuff, and this is my favourite <laughs> album. Um, but I, I actually mean that. Like, um, I like a lot of the stuff that we have done in the past. But by the time I'm finished doing it, I don't really enjoy listening to it, mm. and it doesn't really. The energy's sucked out of it by the time you, you know you've sat in the studio and listened to the same drum fill for four fucking hours. Yeah. But um, this one, when it got finished, I think what I like about it is other stuff that we've done as good as it has been it's always been um, an engineer or producers um, basically what their opinion of what the band should sound like and what I love about this it was recorded by a guy that was in the band Mm. and then when um, Ricky joined the band because it was already at a mixing stage I was like fucking sound sick put it in the shops you know and Ricky went 
let me have a go at mixing this, you know, the, the new guitarist. And then he brought it back and it sounded bang up again. Mm. And what spun me out, I think it's the first time it sounds like standing in the rehearsal space with Frankenbach. You know, it actually sounds like we sound rather than, you know. Than a really it's, polished <coughs> fucking Yeah, it's not polished at all. No it's, processing it yet. sounds like we kind of sound like live. And when I listen to this record, it's really weird. I still enjoy it. Yeah. I still like listening to it and it gives you that kind of like kind of vibe that metal should it's got that kind of energy about it you know um, where the other ones sort of don't really give me that by the time they're done yeah. um, I'll put this on to run through the set you know even just practice it or whatever or I might put on one particular song apart to reference a bit and I find that I still listen to the album in its entirety and still really enjoy the songs mm. which yeah, we've fluked it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys, being newer on this one, do you, and, but you were fans beforehand or knew the band beforehand, do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah I, I've liked every generation of Bok. Yep. Um, but it, it is, for me, this is, it's very raw and it is very pure. So I know it sounds like a fucking wank when I say it. Fuck, I hate saying that out loud. It's pure. Sounds, <laughs> it, does, it sounds like a real wank when you're, you say it out loud, doesn't it? <laughs> But no, it is. say out loud sounds like a real one. Get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Even that. <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> but no, it, 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 I like it. I, I, I enjoy listening to it because, like he says, it is like just being in the fucking rehearsal studio with us. Um, you can hear everything, but it's, it's ballsy and it, it, it kicks you in the fucking ass. Mm. It's a good album. Buy it. <laughs> Buy two copies. Yeah, well, one for both ears <laughs> and your wild frontier. No, that's Daniel Boone. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, where can people get this from? Because you've been you were talking about brushes the other day, but <laughs> <laughs> I see it at the Virgin Mega Store. <laughs> um, you can order it online on uh, through Nerve Gas. Um, I believe uh, JB stocking it now. Don't which believe is, that. Which you, is... you put the post up a bit. Don't give him that shit. I don't, I don't believe don't believe anything I say no I, I, I see the picture and I believe what I see anything I see I believe I believe everything I read too I believe we can get it here when he knows for, for I believe fact I'll have another it. beer anyway um, yeah you can get it yeah but JB's as good as anywhere but you know um, I think everybody buys music online these days yeah, but you can or get best it come to a show yeah come or, to a show you can get it at Utopia um, in Sydney you can get it at uh, Radical Records in Dandenong oh cool Nice. Yeah. So, leading off from Vicious Lawless, you had the single and the video clip for um, Stalker Stalker. Yep. Apparently based on a true story. Yep. It was the dog. <laughs> the dog is very busy. The dog's very gets busy. around very intelligent, knows how to work, use a computer and shit. <laughs> it always amuses me when it says based on a true story. It's, yep. it's very, very loosely. Yep based on I wrote it trying to be funny about some pretty serious shit that was actually happening as I mean he can tell that fucking story but where and then the the idea from the film clip obviously wants to tell the story of the song so we used (coughs) actual lines and phrases that this psycho chick that was actually stalking as like I think it says in the... Yeah, you, you and your family um, are fucked, I'm coming for you. Yeah, yeah that that was, last that, She year, actually yeah. said that. Actually right. said that. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, so there are aspects of it that are actually really true. But, yeah, when it says based on a true story, yeah, it's, it's loosely based on a true story because in, my, in, in the lyrics, it goes a little bit further where um, I think some of the last lines of the song is just find me, catch me, pull the trigger. Mm. So that kind of didn't happen. I mean, he's still sitting here. <laughs> I had a vest. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> a leather vest. Yeah, it was, yeah. I was going to say velvet. Arseless chaps. Not that <laughs> yeah, you can't see that with what he's got. He's sitting down. No, it is. That's right. <laughs> it's very cold. It is. <laughs> Two cold spots. <laughs> I'm going straight to the Blue Oyster Bar after here. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, it's it's very loosely based on a true story, and that's where the whole film clip idea came from. It, mm. um, yeah, so. Shane Borg did the video from Might Die Productions. Um, not necessarily necessarily a, a rock and roll dude. Um, he does a lot of like extreme sports, motorbikes, you okay. know, guys setting themselves on fire, kind of all that wild shit. Mm. And um, 
I known him for a while and what she's editing and stuff and he's just a gun at what he Fantastic does. Fantastic to work with. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a few ideas of some other people that we wanted to work with and I remember watching one of his videos going, there's a little part that he did and like, that's exactly the same sort of thing that I'm talking about as far as her smoking ice and going through this morphous where, you know, yeah. reality thing. And I asked him to do it and what it was about and also the the ice message, you know, like the anti fucking ice mm. thing. He was not like, just anti ice, anti drugs, really. He yeah. was like, yeah, yeah, man. He's because you know, everyone these days knows someone or knows someone yeah. who's got a friend who's fucked at smoking ice, you know. Yeah. And he said, we should say something about this shit. And so oh, he, yeah. the other thing we didn't want, we didn't want fire in the fucking film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick to death of seeing film clips with fire. The band playing in a fucking field in a circle of fire, or there's big, big fucking fire cannons coming off. Like, get fucked. There's a fire barrel in the middle of it. They're all warming their hands. You can get fucked. Unless you're, um, who were we talking about before? Them fucking up to us guys. Oh, oh, if yeah, you're on the fire, you want. Yeah, yeah. They can get away with it. They, or rival fire. They. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I, I won't interrupt your story anymore. Yeah, the, the old logo. Is that upsetting you? No. Okay. Anyway, I'm sorry, I, I won't interrupt any further. I don't know what I was talking about. You were talking about the film yeah, clip and Borgie. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, so we asked him to do it, and we had a couple of like meetings and shit, and like he sat down there writing down stuff, and every part that I told him that it was important to me to get this little bit and all that, I couldn't believe when I watched the video back. It's like, He's got it all there, yeah. and, it, and it reads perfectly to the story that I told. And um, Mish Vogel, that um, played the stalker, she hadn't really done that sort of thing before, but she was, I'm like, do you mind, like, smoking a glass pipe on, like, camera? And she was like, yeah, fuck enough. She didn't care. Um, having her involved in the meetings and stuff, she just took charge, and she was like, right, everyone shut up, I'm going to write this again. And, like, you know, getting props yeah, and doing awesome. research on, like, you know, Looking at she did crackhead research, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah she hung around Danny Long for six months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was watching documentaries on um, on the way that they move and all that sort of shit. It was yeah. she did really fucking. Was at the end of the scratching of the neck and yeah. yeah, she took it on board really, really well and then just nailed the and job. Fucking owned it, yeah. yeah. And what was weird is like Borgie, when he was talking when we were having these production uh, meetings, he was like saying to me, "I kind of want to stop the song." and like tell a bit of the story. And yeah. I was like, nah, mate. Like straight away, gut reaction, you don't do that. You know, I can't stop our song. And I was like, I've come to you for a reason, so I'll listen to you, you know? And then he said, actually, you think about stopping it a couple of times. I'm like, say what now? Well, it goes for nearly twice as long as a song. It's, it's yeah. a six minute video with yeah. a three minute song, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was like, oh, yeah, okay, okay. And then when I went over to his joint to see the first edit, he just put the headphones on, put it on the big screen, and I just couldn't stop smiling. Because it was just, couldn't believe it all worked. It all worked, and me and him did talk about, oh, I don't want to put out another, I don't want to put out a video like a lot with fucking fire and shit. Because <laughs> I've been seeing lots of that, you know? Yeah. These bands, and they're you know, big production video, and it looks all cool, and everyone looks tough, and there's like a fucking fire going on. You sort of go, you know, about halfway through it, and go, eh, next. Because we've seen that shit a lot. Mm. And the fact that this was a bit, like, confronting yep. and a bit not the done thing and that the song's stopping and starting, the whole little bit of a punk rock attitude is like, well, I want to do something different and make challenges you and something that's like, I don't know if you can do that. Well, we just have, you know? Yeah. I really want to do something. the storyline into the video clip. That's it. Yeah, it's something. story we brought well, up before. That, that was yeah. the thing that we really talked about beforehand is we wanted the, we wanted the clip to tell the story we didn't really know how we were going to do it, but we knew we wanted an extended start and an extended end. Yeah. And we all, from our original idea, it was going to have that start, it was going to play the song through, and then it was going to end. <laughs> and the way that it turned out, the way that Borgie's idea came about, it was so much fucking better. Yeah. And it's Even just... Even involved in the planning process of it was yeah. this time around, because we've never done our own video shoot before, and working with uh, Borgie on this, it was yeah. kind of like he was bouncing off us as much as we're bouncing yeah. off him as well and we we had a couple of planning sessions where we planned like how we're going to shoot the scenes and for continu continuation you have to think okay this is going yeah. to be dark at that time so we need to be able to film all these scenes there and so yeah that was a that was a cool part of the process I really I'm calling my friends going anyone got like a a glass pipe 
Or a cop light. Why? <laughs> nah, but why? <laughs> I've got three. I'm like, I just need one, man. And the, and then, like, you know, the ice pack, well, this is naughty. And then, like, finding, like, at home, experimenting with ice. No, with, with like, um, different things. Like, oh, yeah. Ended up burning shit. Different things that are going to burn and look real. I found that really fun. I've always been mm. kind of interested in props and, you know, the... The details around the story, yeah. but we, we ended up using Vicks, Vicks paper, paper dryer. Dryer. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah, because yeah, of the sugar the and shit. Yeah. And I think we might have tipped a little coke in there, like Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah, um, Coca Cola for the bubbling effect. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And like Borgie yeah. said, that his mouse most pr- uh, proud moment of the whole video is the bubble and the dirt on the glass and all that. He said, "We nailed that shit." You know? oh. He's just yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they spent ages trying to it really looks real. It's trying easier to get smoke it to crack than do that. Trust me. <laughs> 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 it took us to do it. <laughs> so, where does He Man at the end come from? That was weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was over He Man. He Man was over at my house. No, we were. Um, Jeff Shearer as well. I was called. watching. <laughs> you, you know, she like when you're, when you're a dad, kids are all into like Pokemon and all that sort of shit. Yeah. You're like. Fuck all that, man. Watch yeah. this. Yeah. And I was like, showing him Master of the Universe. And then I saw this like little speech at the end. I was like, that was almost like it was written for us. Mm. And as a joke on the, our, um, you know, group message thing, I just put it up there like, we should have this at the end. Ha huh? And everyone was like, yes. yeah, I thought he was serious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, I'm, yeah I'm no, I'm ser- and then it just, I was, you know, said to Borkin, he's like, absolutely. And I think what was cool about it is... Um, well, He-Man became the running joke throughout the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. He's, mm-hmm. he, there's Master of the Universe on in the background the oh, whole time. And, you know, a bit of pop culture type thing. But um, <laughs> he was all about that bit, you know. Then just it just tied in so well. And what I like about it is it's got nasty ice smoking. Mm. And it's got a chick that's all like getting scabs and this and that. But somehow along the video, it's almost like you've got Benny Hill shit. There's like, you know, um, slapstick stuff going on, these idiots, you know, having a barbecue. And um, so you go through this quite a heavy thing. There's like a stalker and like drugs and shit. And then it ends with like Master of the Universe. You're like, how we ended up making like a, <laughs> like with a, <laughs> at the end, it's somehow we managed to like lighten up the situation at the end. So it was, yeah, it was like that. And we were like, I said to Borgie, can we do that? Can we use that and without permission or whatever? Do we have to bring Skeletor and see if it's cool? Or we're not going to get sued by, you know. Golf Lundry? <laughs> <laughs> I must sue you. <laughs> but um, he's like, absolutely, these days it's a free for all. He gives a fuck. And he said, you know what? If Man at Arms like, wants to take you to fucking court, he's like, this would be great. You know, he gives a shit. The, the best thing that could happen is like. Publicity. Yeah, Good publicity. And, uh, every time we've been told that this could, we could get into trouble for this. Nothing's ever happened. No. <laughs> so we've really tried to upset people, but, you know. <laughs> we'll see you go after this interview. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to send it to him, aren't you? Oh, maybe. Who knows? A huge team, man. <laughs> send it to Skeletor. <laughs> <laughs> On this topic, I guess, generally speaking, just what about the... Because the album's a shorter album. It's about 33 minutes, I think it is. Yeah, we, we, like that. Remember? We, we cut off some fat. There was a couple of extra songs and all that, but I think that we we found it could have worked on these songs, worked and we went, let's just concentrate yeah. on all our energy into these songs. And I think we're all a fan of so many great records are short, and so often I love when a record finishes and it starts playing again and go, I can go again. Mm, mm. Um, ain't nothing worse I think it was like one of the Slipknot albums like it should have finished like six songs earlier yeah. you know because you kind of like when it finishes you're like cool want to go put some weird woodwind on or something you know mm. like you just grow tired and I think it's best to leave people hungry and mm. I think you know like some of the some of the earlier Slayer albums are 40 minutes man and yeah. they're just so easy to listen to the whole album over and over and over again rather than it being too long same as a live performance I think you should leave people like going fuck I wish they'd play some more rather than like do you want to go these guys are like you know back to back soloing thinking they're great fucking it's like 14 songs later you know I think it's better to leave them keen rather than bored you know mm. so we'll bore the shit out of them on the next record <laughs> <laughs> we'll put on all the crap that didn't make it all the last six albums uh, yeah. do call me baby <laughs> <laughs> do that one <laughs> Where does the the general songwriting inspiration 
kind of come from, be it lyrically or musically, or uh, this one, like Stork, Stork, we were talking about before, are based in yep. a real occurrence, but is it all the stuff stemming from that kind of thing, or where does, or is it, you know, fictional um, ideas? Um, I reckon it's, a lot of it's personal experience or experience of, like, things that sort of happen around us. Timmy's very good songwriter, like, we see things that go on with, like, our friends or our friends' families and stuff like that, and you see a lot of people going through a lot of shit. And the thing I think Frank and Buckley's always tried to do was not make out like we come from, like, Planet Awesome in a universe that you couldn't possibly understand. We like to write about shit that people listen to go, fuck yeah, man, I know what that feels like. I've been through that, you know, and to sort of relate to people a little bit like yeah. that. Yeah. I think Timmy's pretty good at that. You know, some Timmy's of it's social shit, yeah, stuff yeah. that happens with between you and your friends, relationship breakdowns or whatever, or just having your back against the wall going through the hardest shit and, you know. Yeah, that's what that's what a lot of Timmy's stuff is definitely about. My stuff, uh, I'll leave it a little bit more ambiguous, except for, well, Stalker Stalker is obviously about as I was making fun of him. Um, <laughs> The last song, Fuck Off or Destroy, I wrote that around the working title of the song, mm -hmm. which was Fuck Off and Destroy. Because, well, some of the working titles were hilarious. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was really clever and changed the and to or and wrote it about being in a mosh pit. It's either don't, either you get in there, if you're going to be in the mosh pit, you fucking get in there and you have a go, otherwise don't waste my fucking time. Mm. That's what that song's about. As far as, fuck, what have I called him? As far as chaos of, uh, of chaos and fear and segregate the masses, well, I don't know. I'll leave that up to the listener to decide what they're about. Yep. I, I've never really written about anything sort of specific. Um, this was one of the first thing, or this album was one of the first things where I've written two songs which had specific stories to it or specific meanings to it, mm -hmm. whereas I never really did that before. Now you have been touring. Yes. And you have more touring coming up. Yes. So where can people see you? Plug away. Go on. We wrote Lose those dates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we should have bought it We wrote this shit down because we know that we're done well, the, the, first, the first date I can tell you, it's uh, uh, 19th of August at the Evelyn. Yep. And that's our first uh, show to kick off the, the Frankenbock tour for the Vicious Lawless. Well, well, um, if you can zoom in on that sure. <laughs> if you send the artwork to me I can put it up on the screen yeah, let's go through the dates so we've got uh, Saturday 19th of August at the Evelyn Hotel in Melbourne and then kicking off again next Friday the 25th of August we're heading up to Sydney at the Baldface Stag uh, the next night we'll be shipping up to Brisbane um, for the back room there it's obviously Which... never in the debating team. He just reads. He doesn't look up at the camera. Why <laughs> well, bother when you can't do it? But... <laughs> um, so we've got back room on the 26th of August in Brizzy. Uh, 1st of September, the Boston in Perth. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday the 2nd of September at the Edinburgh... Edinburgh? Castle. Edinburgh. It's spelled Berg. It's pronounced yeah, bruh. All right. Edinburgh. Edinburgh. You don't say Keysburg, do you? Give me a bake, bruh. Yeah. <laughs> Edinburgh <laughs> Castle Hotel Greensburg <laughs> we're going to Greensburg in Adelaide <laughs> that's on the 2nd of September Edinburgh you, I was thinking about other shit <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking these are all going to sell out man so fucking after that promo <laughs> cool. yeah, oh. it's going to pump them right up <laughs> we'll see you at the that's front you can, uh, see you at the front bar at the Edinburgh Co yeah. Hotel <laughs> Edinburgh let that go through man it's going to be perfect as it is <laughs> oh that's brilliant <laughs> yeah if you can decipher that come to us <laughs> <laughs> and we've got fucking wicked bands playing like all yeah. the bands on it are, are sick There's, you know I didn't uh, some of my well a lot of them I actually didn't know hadn't heard before when we did the um, Cherry Bar Ant Festival, yep. you know, hanging out backstage with other, like, shady, hairy dudes, and they're like, oh, right, we're playing with you guys in Perth. And I'm like, oh, cool, you know, and then, uh, excuse me, dude, and they're on the stage, so I get to watch these bands that we're going to be playing with in a month or so. It's been, yeah. it's they're cool, all... and it's exciting to see bands that, it's cool to play with your mates and shit, like, you know, we've been playing with Dreadnought since the dawn of time, mm. but it's also really awesome to see a band get up there and launch into it and you've got no idea what to expect and walk away fans of new stuff, you yeah, know? Fucking nice. Meet new dudes and all that sort of shit. And, and very organised too, like, 
we've we've been sort of chatting to them just to get back lines sorted and everything at the moment and mm. it's it's just going ahead way smoother than we thought it would try and organize sort of i don't know 15 bands is it 20 bands maybe yeah something yeah like the whole tour so and granted and something it's already just friends, it's all but... falling in line so bands are getting better at being organized mm. <coughs> and, uh, we, um, the more bands can work together like that the better the shows will be and yeah. the better they're going to run so. yeah for sure hopefully we can keep that up so. yeah we signed up with um, uh, a booking agency called Dirt House and um, Jason Finlay who runs that he's just incredible like uh, you know he, his job is to book shows and that's kind of all he's supposed to do but I'll, sp- I'll speak to him a couple of times a day and his job's just to go, okay, here's the show, here's the date, whatever the hell. But instead, he's he's creating all these Facebook uh, conversations with all the bands. He's making flight phone calls, organising, like, amps for us to use, um, doing our flyers, doing these so hands-on. And um, it's actually been since been talking to him that I feel that he's actually put some fire back into the band. As he said straight away... He said, can I tell you what I think about Frankenbock? I was like, go for your life, man. You're on the other side of the country. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you guys are a bunch of dads, man, that just play like random gigs that don't mean anything anymore. He said, the scene or the industry sees you guys as a kind of a used to be band that you just do the odd show and it doesn't amount to anything. He says, what you need to do is do a tour get five or six shows together, call it something, put a paint job on it, get a, get a promoter, get somebody and, and let the industry know that he's a back, he's a touring band again. He says, I have a little bit of a plan for you guys. And a couple of things he sort of said, I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. I'm like, wait a minute, I'll come to you for help. So I better listen to him. And he's been right about everything as far as, you know, and he's a good dude as well, so... Yeah, he's helps. a top dude. But just organising organizing all this shit for us and, you know, he's been right about everything so far and appreciate having that dude on board. It's been mm. been awesome. Well, on that regard, you've been working with Chris Marrick as well. Marrick, yeah. yeah, he's, he's so kicking ass. How's that come about? And, and I guess having your album serviced out to so many people through that kind of thing. We've, we've, that? we've done some stuff with... Um, Chris years ago um, we put out a DVD and we're like what the fuck man and he's like no one gives a shit dude I tried but no one cares about a live DVD and we didn't get anywhere with that you know but um, there was a couple of names that came up and again Jason's like he's got his ear to the ground he knows everybody he said well there's two dudes you'd work with you know there's like Tim Price uh, and Chris Merrick and he said I think Chris Merrick suits you guys he's the metal guy he knows what he's doing and all that and so I had a few chats with him and he was up for doing it, and um, yeah, he, he's been at it, and I'm getting interviews thrown at me left, right, and center, and reviews and all that sort of shit. And it's again uh, taking Jason's advice, having somebody handle you, and you actually like we've been throwing money into the band, you know, throwing money into you. You got to pay for promotions, mm. you know. It's 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 a bit rare calling up in our radio station going, hey. Would you like to do an interview with me? <laughs> you know, that's a bit how's it going. Yep. But having someone's like, yeah, I got as a bock, and he thinks he's a big deal, and I can get you on the line with him. It's 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 more professional mm. having people organise that stuff with you, and it's all about pretending you're a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and if you just might get away with people might go, oh, they're a big deal. And it's like, Shh, you know. So you just get that image out and make it look big, and people think it. It's big and therefore it will be big. Big. <laughs> yeah. That, so I he's knew believing, that wasn't he, done yet. He's believing, oh, he's believing yeah. everything I say. You thought it was going to be a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. It's small time. Only behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Balls. There is going to be no beer on when you use every frame of this. <laughs> oh, <brilliant. laughs> the. Something else I wanted to bring up with you guys that we're talking about the upcoming tour and not just before, and that is what are the live shows like now with the new lineup? A, a good friend of ours saw you guys, I think, play the <coughs> Ant Festival and he said it was off. I think you even went outside at one point during the. Um, he was thrown out for being somebody else. <laughs> <up. laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's another story. Yeah. I, I, this particular show, I didn't go outside, but there's occasions where I do and that's just me mm. um, I went up the back and I, I get in people's faces and I sit with them and 
I like to interact with people. That's why I've got the wireless mic. And um, thankfully, people have received <coughs> what I do. Without beating well. you to they death. They have to because they hold hulk to see. That's another story as well. But no, um, every show I've had a few people come up to me and go, man, I, I was really wary when Box said that they were getting a new singer, but mate, you fucking killed it. And I'm, I, I couldn't be happy, you know. So yeah, I, I bring, I try and keep Bok the way it was, but I also bring my own thing to it. Mm. And yeah, I get out into the crowd and I get in people's faces and I'll walk around and I'll touch people and annoy people and and do that sort of thing but yeah it's been fucking really cool to uh, um, some of these old school people that have been coming to shows since the beginning 20 years mm. and so one of them dudes come up to me last Saturday night at the show not the one before but uh, they've been seeing shows since the beginning and they're like mate best best lineup ever he said You've, it's still exactly the same he said probably the best it's ever been and I'm like yeah job well done because you know what I was worried about what you would think man you know because he's been in this band for like 20 years and if you know it's no good for like one of your favourite bands to mm-hmm. be you know all changed and it's just not the same anymore but has some of these dudes go on oh, it's the best it's there. ever been, been yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that means a lot to me to people actually saying that it's like well, it means a lot to me the people are saying that well fucking I am now from one of my favourite bands as a teenager, I am now part of the best lineup of that band. It was just, it's just <coughs> fucking incredible. And why that's worked is because the guys that are in the band have been fans of the band, and as I was saying before, they know how exactly how to act and behave. Mm. They they know what this band's about. So it's just straight in. There's mm. been no like everyone knew exactly what to do, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's still heavy as all fuck, yeah. but. Um, it's, it's still also the stupid It's still element quite too. ridiculous yeah, yeah. as well. <laughs> and I think a lot of people actually enjoy Frankenbach as far as that. You watch a lot of bands play and they're very, very serious and they're very, very tough and all that sort of shit. And they see us like playing blast beats and grinding, but going <laughs> like <laughs> giggling and shit. And they're like, these assholes are having a great time. <laughs> you know, and that, that kind of energy breeds energy. People yeah. see you having a good time. And they'll have a good time. They'll have a good time as well. But if you're up there and you're like, oh, I missed the arpeggio, and they're like, you know, stressing out, they go, that energy comes back. If you're not enjoying it, they won't enjoy it, you know? Yeah. Whereas, like, if we make a mistake, fuck, I'll point it out. Yeah. Tommy fucking drop it. Throwing sticks <laughs> <laughs> Throwing fucking sticks like you wouldn't believe. Five times. Yeah. Yeah. In one couple of songs. <laughs> yeah, like, in two songs, there was... Sticks all off. I'm exaggerating, obviously, but yeah, sticks all over the front of the fucking stage, and but we wrote with it, and uh, yeah, we got the crowd it. into it, and then the third song, I didn't drop a stick, and everyone fucking went mad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we made it. Like, yeah, that's it. You and, get the crowd, and we the crowd love into doing it. shit like that, yeah. and just making it stupid as well. Yeah, uh, you've got to have that fun on stage, yeah. and that's what. Well, that's what I've always seen Frankenbock as being about. Is just. It's just that's when it, when when people go to see a show, you mm. want to feel like you're part of the show as much as you want to watch the show. A lot of the time, if you get drawn into it, you know, then you had a better night yeah. the next day when you reflect on it, and that's that's what we try to go for with our crew. Yeah, when, when you drop the sticks, part of the show, so. he he plays with his fucking hands. Yeah, he'll and drop the stick. Yeah, he, stop. he can't get a fucking <laughs> he can't get to a stick. Fuck it, I'll just play with my fucking hand. Which part of me fingers the boniest? <laughs> <laughs> I turn around because I could hear, <laughs> and I'm like, what's going on? I can see he's hitting. <laughs> I said, you finished the song with your head, yeah, I was trying to get a bit of bone in it. Like, it's suffering for your art, you know. It's, it's incredible. It's, and obviously, from an audience perspective, to watch that, instead of a drummer going, fuck, I've dropped a stick, oh shit, I'm going to stop playing now, I've got to find it. Yeah. They see this guy playing with his fucking hands. They see a caveman again. Yeah. That's yeah. It's just fucking brilliant. Even I turn around and I, I, there's some parts of the song where if I'm singing and I turn around and watch him, Especially with the faces that he pulls. If I turn around and watch him, I can't sing because I'll be too busy laughing. I don't know what the faces that I pull either. It's just like <laughs> the music sort of takes you and yeah. Uh, yeah, it sort of... Ah, yeah. Like, they're, yeah. they're the faces, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. It's like when it gets too intense and you're, you're blasting and it's too fast for too long and you're just like... Ah! <laughs> just screaming. Like, and people look at that and they, they go, yeah, he's getting into it. You're like, help! Like, yeah, you've got to have a fucking heart attack. Like, like. That thing's sort of sometimes like... It's almost like a... Being in a car that's going really, really fast and it gets the speed wobbles and shit, and all of a sudden it's out of control and shit, <laughs> and it's possibly going to roll, and there's always like one sick cunt in the back going. <laughs> you know, it's definitely, we're sidewards a lot of the time, we're not totally in control, but 
we usually manage to get, get it back it. on the road. Yeah. Like, whoa, so we almost rolled it, man. <laughs> but, you know, but you get, you know, you, you, you spend a lot of time rehearsing and just so much time. You all, you guys spend a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I spend a lot of time calling you going, where are you, man? <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then the other half of the time is I'll be on my way to practice. Oh, we haven't got it tonight. Yeah, they're set up to teach you a lesson. Yeah, pre- <laughs> <laughs> but, um, It's happened a few times. But, you know, so much of your life goes into being in a band's all about waiting around to be in a band. Mm. You know, like you're playing tonight, but you're going like, to wait for like 12 hours before you do anything. And so when they go ding, ding, and it's on, you've got 45 minutes, it's just you go all out because you've got 45 minutes to validate all this shit. You know, all that time, all that sacrifice, all that money and all that mm. horse shit that goes into it, you've got 45 minutes to prove yourself. And if, if you're not sweaty after a gig, I don't know, like, you know, you, sh- you should be have given everything you've got, you know. Mm. Well, it's, you've got 45 minutes to totally run amok. Yeah, yeah no one can yeah, really do anything about it. Things you get for on the sidewalk, That's you the can best do that part. on the stage. <laughs> but yeah, the best part, no one can do a fucking thing about it because it's your fucking stage. It's just like one big amplified tantrum. Yeah. One big long hissy fit. Yeah. <laughs> It's good. Fun. <laughs> now, we were talking earlier that Frankenbot has been around for 20 years now. Yep. And different this incarnations along the way and, and all that has been there. And even from the newer members, there's <coughs> going to be elements of this band that have shifted and changed, and, and you in particular, obviously, from the start. But what's the biggest thing individually or collectively or if it's just you whatever you want to put this as but what's the biggest thing you've learned along the way after 20 years of this I don't think I've learned anything <laughs> <laughs> um, social media no I don't know that's the catch that's is once you think you know what's question. going on everything changes yeah. and you've got to relearn the way that you do things but so we, we, we kind of, Frankenbox has been alive through the whole transition of the music industry from where mm. you go to brashes and buy the CD to everything being digital and online now. Oh, I thought you were going to say to JB. <laughs> well, to, to <laughs> JB, yeah, in the recommended section. Yeah. <laughs> Next to the white goods. <laughs> yeah, when you buy a fridge, get a free copy. <laughs> I think... Uh, Wouldn't that be a cool promotion? Yeah. I think fridge one of the box. things that I, I reckon you definitely box. learn is... Um, Everyone starts out in the band probably wanting to be Metallica one day and get your own private jet or some shit, and then then reality sets in. And it's this is not that boring thing. It's, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey, but mm. it's true. Like um, we were talking before about, I think one of the worst things that could happen to this band or a lot of band would be success, man, because all of a sudden, you know, the stakes are high. People can see that they're going to start making money out of you and they're going to start pushing you to work really, really hard, and then it becomes work. Um, Sometimes I've just been like pinching myself, like going, I like all these guys. Like I like being around all the people that are in the band. We have a good time at rehearsal. We have a great time at shows. And like, you know, I'm having a good time playing music and I can still hold down a job and I've got time for a family and all that. I'm like, fuck, I've got it all, man. Like the fact that if we, we all manage to do everything we want and we're having a great time playing music, isn't that making it? You know, because I think that some of the bands that have been seen to have made it and they look like because they're up there doing all this, there's some very unhappy people there, like wishing yeah. they were at home, you know, going, yeah, after tonight I'm going to tell them they can all get fucked. You know? yeah. I, I just think that, you know, that whole like enjoy the moment type thing, you know, and enjoy if you. If you don't enjoy band practice, you wouldn't know anything about that. But <laughs> if you don't enjoy band practice, like maybe you shouldn't be doing it, you know, because if you need to have somebody watching for you to actually being, you know, like it, mm. <coughs> maybe you're doing it for the wrong reasons or something like that, you know. We sometimes like, it's great playing to a bunch of people that really enjoy what you're doing. That's a good feeling. But sometimes you go home more stoked from an awesome rehearsal where it just clicks, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. We all pretty much act the same way at rehearsal <coughs> as we do on stage. Pretty much. Yeah. Well, granted, in rehearsal, it is sometimes a little bit more subdued, but other times it's fucking more wild. Especially when we had uh, Mick uh, come in and play drums 
at the same time as Tommy, so we had two fucking drum kits set. Playing the one song. Yeah. <laughs> Playing the one song. It was just... Have a wall of drums. It was yeah. fucking terrifying, man. <laughs> I actually was, like, frightened of it because, like, two drummers and, like, double up the cymbals and when they can't... Oh. And there's, like, two guys... It's so much louder. And I was like... Yeah. But it was so much fun. Yeah, there was just a lot of energy in the room. It was, yeah. it was funny. And watching these guys play, because they're playing exactly the same thing, with slight differences mm. in style and all that. We watched the video back and it was very strange to watch because they've got different styles, but they're playing the same bits. Yeah. So when we yeah. did the Stalker video, what are we going to do with the drums in this? Because we didn't even, we're not even going to have a drum kit in it. And I kind of had the idea of like um, Mick and Tommy back to back because they both know exactly how to play this stuff. And it's almost like they've worked out the moves because they, they're synchronised. Mm. But so putting it's it like back to back, the, the bird's eye footage, it's all sort of mirror image synchronized, yeah. which is pretty cool to watch. But and then we did flashes of Mick there, and <coughs> changes to me, and then we yeah. flick them between the two. And mm, that's cool. So, yeah. and isn't there in some sections you can just see Mick sitting on a chair like this? No, I think so. Yeah, yeah there's flickers. Of, yeah, yeah. There's, if, if you pause so it at the right moment, yeah, because yeah. wow. Mick was sitting there for the whole time we were filming, and it's just like this, he doesn't move. Mm. What was bizarre about it too was even when I watch it back now, there's no drums in it, but I feel them. Mm. Like, because you, you're both pretending, and because there's so much shit going on, but when you're doing that, do, 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 yeah, like, yeah, you can chill. I can hear yeah. it, so I believe I see drums there, and it's yeah. just bizarre that there's no kit there. Yeah. Yeah, it's but yeah, it's all in perfect synchronization and everything as well. A lot of people haven't noticed there's no kit in it yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> you tell them, what? They go back for another look. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh sounding references to things we were talking about before. Uh, You've got to keep playing with them, I'm going to take them off you. We were doing a lot with our balls before we... <laughs> <laughs> I do have that little bit at the start. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Oh, do we? Fine. <laughs> I guess after <coughs> so long, for Frankenbach anyway I guess one thing is what would you like to say to the fans keep coming to shows keep buying our fucking records like um, it it sucks to do the hard sell but you know when people like you've been jumping on like just order your record or when they buy a t-shirt it's not an ass kiss when I'm there going fuck it thank you man I really appreciate that because it means we can move forward you know so when people are actually, you know, some people are like, oh, I got the record, but I bought it again anyway, man, because I want to help you guys out. And it's like, if you're not in a band, you don't know how much that actually really does. Yeah. Like every time we get three or four sales, like, sick, man, we were actually going to be able to afford like, air tickets, you know? Like, yeah. So that kind of support, because a lot of people, everything's available for free these days, yeah. but you get a lot of people that like, I won't do it, mate, I want to support you. So that, that means a lot, and that really, really makes a difference, you know? Yeah. And all the lifers, you know, we've got... We've got, we got ourselves some Marks, Mark Hogan and Mark Osborne and all that. And these guys just... Compete to be number one. Yeah, they're the most into Frankenbach, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I watch them like, yeah, well, I'm we going to all the shows. It's like, yeah, well, I stayed at one of their houses. You know, like, they're, <laughs> they're like, you know, that sort of shit really helps, you know. Just yeah. mad supporters. It's great. Yeah. Or thank you for accepting the new members. Yeah, and, and thanks for sticking it out this long, yeah. you know, and... and just, I'm, I'm spun out the, the reviews that we're getting on the... The new record are amazing. It's like I said, I think we fluked it. I think we've accidentally, accidentally done a good record here. You know? <laughs> and, and like, you know, live shows are going to be sick because that's what you're going to get. It's going to sound like that, but it's um, you get the ferocious visuals and sweat and slime and snot and <laughs> everything else that sort yeah, of goes on. Bushman's blow that as it does over. <laughs> fucking but, yeah, having, having, having people turn up to a show these days, it's not just like, eh, cool, there's people here, it's like, we're very lucky because, you know, it's not our band, it's a lot of bands and good bands, bands that absolutely blow me away. And uh, I won't mention any names, but dude, close friends of mine, probably one of the best bands ever, did their CD launch. And they're like, 30 payers, mate. And I'm like, and all the bands they had on there were shit hot. And for interstate bands, it was a really big show. And it's like, it breaks my heart. To yeah. know that you know there's such talent, and 30 people are going, you know, yeah. and it's not because the bands are shit. It's because no, definitely not. Entertainment's changed. People, you know, there's so many different forms of entertainment now. Like mm. 
30, 40 years ago, what do you do for it? Like, oh, I like going out, seeing live music, walks on the beach, you know, that sort of yeah. shit. Now people don't go out and you walk on the beach, you get a syringe in your foot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, say, oh, that used to be nice one of the, the main sense of, uh, sorts of entertainment was going out and seeing bands and now, like, stay home and watch fucking Netflix or something, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Sit you on know? fucking YouTube all night, sit on Facebook all fucking night. Yeah. We, we, we are, you know, even when we get 20 people to a show, it's still like, fucking thanks, you know, yeah. it's, it's good. Yeah. Before we start to wrap up, something I like to get out of bands at the moment, there's always that trendy sort of question that an interviewer has for themselves. And for me, this is, I guess, <coughs> your thoughts on the current industry today, the way it exists and, and functions, but also as a flip side to that, the importance of continuing music and art in society. The industry sucks rhinoceros dicks. <laughs> you like the hard questions, don't you? Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> I think basically it's all about <laughs> bands learning to become their own business rather than just be a couple of dudes that get up on stage and play and try and entertain people. There's a lot more to it nowadays um, with the digital way that the music industry has gone. Everything is available for free when you want it at, on every device that you have now. Uh, so in Melbourne in particular, for the bands to get noticed in that, you need to be doing big things and continuously doing those things uh, monotonously and to get yourself out to the masses and to get noticed and to, to be able to get yourself out of Australia, which is the goal for most of the bands mm. within Australia. I guess that's what you would call making it nowadays. Um, I don't know, for us it's just a goal, I guess. Um, like one of our big goals would be Japan to do in Europe, if we can. So, yeah, I want to go on Hamasonic. Yeah, Hamasonic. Yeah, Hamasonic. Mm. Over in Malaysia would be awesome. Not, not so keen on Japan, just uh, Fukushima. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, grow a third arm or a second vocal cord. Mate. Yeah, we might as well play fucking Chernobyl, you know. <laughs> the, years ago, like, um, bands just needed to be good bands. And, like, you know, if your drum was shit on, you had a fucking crazy singer and all that sort of shit, like, someone would get behind you and you'd get noticed and you'd do shit. And I see so many bands where these guys are great musicians, but in all five of them no one's like a media guy no one's like a, an accountant no one's you know like the, and I see bands that are not very good but their business and industry skills are fucking amazing yeah. and like some some of the um, some of the deathcore bands maybe um, I'd love to their their Oh, their business side I think the, the music's almost secondary to what they do like mm. you know they've got one kid who runs the merch and he's like fucking unreal he's got they've got all like millions of different kinds of designs and all that and the way it's presented it is unreal and then they've got that media guy and then they've got like the business accounting guy who they've got you know in, involved in this and that and you know you see these bands that have got all these skills and none of it's musical mm. but their band's doing really well because they know how to put themselves out there know how to market themselves and sell it and all that sort of stuff, and that's what I've noticed is really different these days. Because you know, bands like Rose Tattoos used to used to be fucking wicked bands, mm. and then they'd get fucked up for the rest of the time and be party like bands do. There's, there's bugger all time for partying and shit now, because you know, like you finish your gig and all that, and someone's gonna take the money and do this and that, and you gotta be like, you know, it's it's these days it's very much about you've you've all got to. Mm. Someone, everyone in the band has got a, like a little bit of a job to do that's very un rock and roll. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's that's what I've noticed has sort of happened. There's a lot more than just industry. playing the instrument nowadays yeah. to being yeah. in a band. Yeah, it's sort of hard to get to the instrument sometimes. You know, that's yeah. why it's been great having Jason um, involved, like booking shows and stuff, because I just be, spend so much time on the phone doing this and organising that and trying to get that guy to call me back and whatever the shit. And I'm looking at the guitar over there and I'm like, I ain't getting to it to tonight, you know? So having him making phone calls and dealing all that sort of shit gives us a little bit more time to actually play music and stuff. So I think it's a good thing overall because it, it, it weeds out those bands that are just doing it for fun versus the ones that are trying to seriously push mm. themselves to get somewhere with it. And then once they realise they need to do the hard work and they start applying themselves to do it, <coughs> it is entirely possible for any band that puts in that effort to get to where they want to be with it. So, well, no, and have nothing, a ball along the way too. So. There's still nothing wrong with just being a band that just wants to play. That's right, yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. That's right. Because yeah. we, we, we're still kind of that band. We, well, we, we still are that band. We want to do something with it, but... Yeah, we, we like to apply the, the, the New Day markets 
how the market's running nowadays to sort of what we're doing and keep keep it fun yeah while while trying to do all that business side of things uh, uh, so you do it's like doing the work and then the music at the end of it is like the the dessert you know yeah. you get, get your ice cream at the end so. yeah, yeah fuck I think the the second part. Yeah, of the question. second part is, is basically the importance of art and music in today's society. Then is it as important? Is it more important than it was? Fucking as art. important as ever. Yeah. If, you, if you look it's at society, important. I think it's more important than ever. You need to be entertained. You need to like not listen to three AW or watch the fucking news and shit. You need to be able to go chill out and listen to a song and that's something that gives you some good feels or, or look at some great artwork that makes you feel good because if you look at the world it's like it's not that good mm. there's a lot of bad shit not, not that we're all doomed and all that but I think art is probably more necessary than ever to stop people feeling like it's all fucking doomed you know the death of art is the death of freedom yeah that's pretty much it so it's got to be important and you've got to have that where you can go out and go fuck this the art is murder art has no laws that's the beauty of it yeah. it's, 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 it's creativity at it's vicious lawless most yeah one of the great things about art is like you know you're, fuck you fuck <laughs> you want more snow um, I think it's cool that like you know um, you can't really say <coughs> uh, say I was going to say cunt yeah go for it I, um, woof. You're not, woof. <laughs> um, you're not, There's you're, your sound bite. Yeah. You're not really supposed to say stuff like that just in conversation and yeah. certain things and all that. But if it's relevant to art, you can kind of get away with using, yeah. not just for the sake of it, but it's kind of more accepted if you're trying to get your point across in art, you know, yeah. piss Christ and shit like that, yeah. you know. Like, I think that's great that art actually lets people express themselves however weird or wonderful that you know the people are. I see shit that I'm like oh my god I can't believe he's doing and saying that but it's okay because it's his art you know he's not out actually doing it to somebody yet <laughs> <laughs> but you know like, you know you just some some of some bands are you know, king parrot some of the way that they when, when they perform you know you see what young he's like he's a fucking madman mm -hmm. And that's his art. That's his yeah. performance. You go and talk to him. He's a sweetheart, man. Yeah. You know, he'll so opposite. Yeah, so he'll, he'll like such a he'll smash life. the coffee table and fucking throw a beer bottle at you, and then he'll come. He'll, Let's go down to IKEA and buy you a coffee table, and I'll buy you some drinks. I'm really sorry about that. You know, <laughs> that's that's the art part. Yeah. You know, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. People need to realise that art is that sort of expression. I mean, like bands like Cannibal Corpse singing about what they sing about. They're not going out and fucking doing it. It is an art. It's an expression, and you have to have that. Otherwise, well, we're all fucked. Yeah, it's a good point. Art's freedom, man. Yeah. yeah. Well then, what is coming up for Frank and Bob <coughs> over the next twelve those to dates? eighteen <laughs> months? <laughs> um, Should we read the dates again? We've well, got the vicious lawless <laughs> tour. We'll, um, the album is is the tour is coming up. <laughs> tour's coming up um, we'll post you those dates and all yeah. bit, so post you a picture of it um, and, and we're um, I think New Zealand's just been locked in we're going to go oh. across the ditch and have a go over there which yep. is going to be sick we go That's cool. coming up. Yep. Nice. we go over there we've been over there quite a few times and we're playing with 8 Foot Sativa again so that'll, oh, be, nice. yeah. that'll be sick it's always that's one of our favourite places we play it's always fun over there so we've got that happening and I think we've got like a regional show in Canberra it's I think it's part of like a dirt house festival um we're also playing with uh Segression in is it Wagga that's where they're no, from no no Wollongong Wollongong yeah, so, that, Wollongong so their hometown so that should be a ball terror September the 14th I think yep yeah. yeah. the 13th okay. we're in Canberra yeah. I believe yep yeah. so we've got, we've got a, the, the, the rest <laughs> of the year is um we, we've got shit on right up until up until Christmas yeah yeah Cool. And then, and then the, next year, be straight to LA. No idea. Yeah, yeah we're year. not sure what we'll do. Whether we'll do more regional touring. Um, probably try and get down to Tassie and probably do a little bit more regional stuff, which would be good. Get out to Bendigo mm -hmm. and Ballarat and Warrnambool and try and get out to some regional stuff in New South and Queensland and South Oz if they'll have us. And yeah, but with, I, I don't, I don't think. We don't really know what we're actually doing. 
haven't thought that far ahead. We don't care as whilst we're having fun. When it starts to suck, we're like, what the fuck's going on? Right. But whilst it's fun, we're just like happy doing yeah. what we do. Yep. I did want to say though, really excited about having the record coming out and having people like it has been cool. Um, but as much as I'm excited about that, I'm kind of like really excited about what we're going to do. Because yeah. this was like, yeah, it was really difficult and had a lot of the fun sucked out of it through parts. But having new blood in the band and some really talented dudes with different ideas, I think I'm sure. <laughs> Does that even make sense? Come over here and fuck off. But um, I'm pretty... Fuck. I, I feel that the next record that will be done uh, a hell of a lot easier. Um, I, th- I don't think it'll take nearly as much time. Um, and you know, say with, with the, the different influences in the band, I'm really excited about what yeah. we're going to do next. You know, it's been good to get that one done, but knowing what these jokers are capable of, and I, I've, I've, I'm really excited about a, a clean slate <laughs> yeah. and, and writing a new record should be totally cool, you know. Nice. That's what I'm pumped for, getting another one out. Here it is. We do this for everyone. Time for the bin. What are you putting in the bin for mm. us this week? All right. Well, I'll start with this beer bottle. <laughs> and this beer bottle... There's Sydney traffic. Sydney traffic, oh, you can get fucked. Fuck I think itself. Melbourne traffic is fucked, but Sydney is the fucking worst. You can't turn anywhere. We're trying to get to the bald face stag. We turn left when we've got to turn right, and there's a fucking queue going up for three kilometres. How are we supposed to get to the gigs in Sydney? I'm fucking not happy with it. <laughs> in the bin with Sydney traffic. Fucking. I feel better. That's good. good. I'm glad. <laughs> People who pause in the middle of their sentences. Big I'll pause. finish the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. There was a big pause there. Commercial TV can go in the fucking bin. It's time. It's over. It's shit. Um, bloody reality TV shows. Mm-hmm. It's it's shit. Like um, Throw that in it. this can go in the bin. Um, <laughs> what else? Like commercial TV. Once upon a time, you know, they used to show shows mm. on it, and they used to pay actors and writers and. This can go in the bin. No, this is pretty. Don't <laughs> 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 go in the bin. The amount of rubbish that is around here. Is, yeah. That's too good for TV. But yeah, like commercial TV, it's, it's really bad. I think it's really, really bad for yeah. people. Um, I won't let my like I let my kids play like Grand Theft Auto and all that sort of shit. And he, and like we play um, uh, yeah, all kinds of violent video games. And he's the most unviolent, unnasty kid. He knows that this is make believe. This is like mm. entertainment or whatever. But I won't let him, I, I come home and if he's in the room and the news is on, I'm like, turn that shit off. I don't want him to know about that because it's yeah. some scary shit for a child to be hearing about or seeing about. They just, the world's fucked, mate, which it's not. It's not no. fucked, you know, but if you watch enough commercial TV, especially the news or even just them shows, you'll, it has a bad effect on you, yeah. you know, and I drive a truck and I used to listen to a lot of talk radio just because you, know, you can only listen to so many songs and you want to hear discussions or whatever. Mm. I banned myself from listening to that because I started thinking it's all fucked. I mean, I was like worried about the kids going anywhere because I think, you know, fucking the Apex gang are out there and they make you worry about shit and they make you think that everything's actually heaps more fucked than it actually is. So commercial TV, reality TV shows and just fucking news propaganda can all fucking go in the bin. You want to know what's going on out there, go for a walk. Yep. It's, it's, not, it's not as bad and you don't shouldn't be as scared as they want you to be. It's because, you know... That's me. Yep. Put it in the this is supposed to be fun, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it up. <laughs> That'll do, though. <laughs> I thought I'd be like Zeke there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I had nothing when you said it and I started thinking about it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <that'll> <laughs> well, you've timed it right. Burnout King's here, so. Oh, God. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you all you can very put his much. Tires for, in the bin. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably already put him in the bin. That blow tire that four, so it's all right. Got to reverse him in there. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming out. No, I'm right. going forward. It's great yeah, to catch up with you. It's always a blast. Guys, so. Fucking oh, beautiful. Cool. Should, should we do Cheers. that now? No, you can do the bath. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> what about? <laughs> Okay, oh, I'm comfortable now. <laughs> yeah.
Seriously, I'll just want something where I can just pull it out and go. You can hold that. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> you can hold your own fucking elbow. Yeah, do that. And do if that. you pull it in between, you can point at the sponsors on the wall. <laughs> and do it with the awkward smile. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. He's one with bed early. <laughs> 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 oh, fuck. This is always fun. Love doing well, this you, shit. You've bent it. You yeah. asshole. Uh, You're was, giving him a defective he, one. He's giving him one of the warped ones. Oh. <laughs> no one's gonna fuck. No, who has a record player? Me. I do actually. I, know. <laughs> I, I, I knew that so was coming, but I thought I'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> this cunt took both my arms, and well, hey, I was well, in hospital, man. Like, like I said, yeah. wait yeah. until the well, fucking almost. thing, and we'll talk well, about it then. It's it's the story of this. Is it? I'm gonna make some other shit. Out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna totally like, oh yeah, we're into like, so that's my hand hitting dogs and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Nature's fucking stupid. <laughs> and then we'll send it off to paint up. <laughs> at the end of this, should we get up and hold hands and bow to the camera? <laughs> <laughs> do the do the selfie with the the, the crowd so <laughs> there's just cameras in the background. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. Get <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs>